One of my favorite verses in Scripture that I review almost every week is Psalm 19, 10, which says, speaking of God's word, it is more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. I remember a moment in my life about, uh, I, th- I think it was 17 years ago, when I was sitting in an auditorium at a conference, and I heard Craig Cabanis preach on God's Word. And I remember it having a profound effect on me. It was a season in my life where I was really seeking God for direction about a particular decision. And I was sitting in this room, and it was just one of those moments where as he was preaching, I just found myself affected by the Spirit of God as he's proclaiming about God's Word, the priority of it, the privilege of it. And that was only one time that I've benefited from listening to this man, that it will be our guest speaker this morning, talk about the worship of God, the presence of God, the Spirit of God. I remember reading an article that Craig wrote about the Holy Spirit and being profoundly affected by his description of Jesus giving the fountain of God's presence to us. This is a man who has been pastoring for decades. He has led two different church plants, now leads Grace Church Frisco, just three hours up the road from us and dear friends of ours. Uh, He has faithfully preached God's word Sunday after Sunday. And when he stands in front of a, a group of people at church like ours, Um, He stands to deliver God's Word again, full of faith and joy and passion. He is one of my favorite preachers to listen to live, and he's one of the men that Aaron and I look forward to having in to preach to you. So he's a dear friend of ours. He was the lead pastor of the church that brought Aaron Mayfield and his wife Holly into our family of churches, so we personally benefit every week from this man's leadership. If it were not for him, we wouldn't be benefiting from Aaron and Holly. And uh, he is the pastor of my brother, so he takes care of my little brother for me, which I'm very grateful for. Keeps an eye on him, keeps him out of trouble. Appreciate that very much. And most importantly, uh, he is a personal friend that has been relentless in his encouragement of me and of Aaron as we've walked into ministry over the last number of years. So, Craig, we are very grateful to have you. It's an honor to have you. Let's welcome Craig as he comes to preach to us. Well, thanks. uh, Am I on here? Yes. Thanks, John. It is a joy to be here, and I do uh, have a heart for your church and, uh, and love, uh, love your pastors. Uh, I was able to be with them last night, and just to hear all that God is doing in the church, it just built a lot of anticipation for me to be here this morning, uh, just hearing how the Lord's adding to the church, and I can tell that I haven't been here at least in a couple years, and uh, so, so many of you I don't know because you've come in the last uh, couple of years, and as they were just reviewing with me all that's going on uh, in your church, it was wonderful to hear their enthusiasm uh, for what the Lord is doing here. It wasn't just that new people were coming, which is a, which is a blessing, uh, but it was that new people were uh, becoming part of the family here and taking leadership responsibility and uh, really the, uh, new folks owning and becoming part of what the Lord is doing here in this church plant. Uh, that was so ex- encouraging for me to, uh, for me to hear. So uh, I, 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 greetings from our church. We do carry you in our heart, and uh, uh, we do love it, any interaction that we're able to have with folks from your church. I know some of you, some of you may be coming up uh, next month. Uh, some of the leaders will be hosting a conference for our region uh, for leaders, so I hope to see some of you there. We'll be hosting a worship conference for our region there this summer as well. So uh, th- the door is always open for you guys uh, where we are, and uh, especially look to uh, enjoy our partnership of building together, and hopefully as we move forward, planting churches together. So uh, it really is good to be here. Thank you, John and Aaron, and uh, I, I just respect you men so much, and uh, I learned from you and benefit from your, your example in so many ways as well. And this last week, I uh, had the opportunity to teach at our pastor's college uh, Monday through, or Tuesday through Friday, rather, so I was able to... Uh, check in on Bard, and I, I don't know if just to, I can confirm he really is there, and uh, 
I didn't see his wife or children, so I don't know, but he was there. And, uh, and he was sitting on the first row representing Tex as well. Uh, so that was good. He wasn't blowing it, wasn't making us look bad. Uh, he was, he was uh, making these two guys look better than they are. So that's good. It was, uh, it was raising your pastoral team game for sure to have Bart represent. Uh, but uh, he's, he was wonderful. I got to have lunch with him and connect with him and hear about the church. And he's eager to be uh, back with you guys as well. So thanks for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to jump into God's Word. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to uh, Psalm 130. Hey, John, can you hand me my phone? I'm not going to text, but I need to know my time. Thank you. Psalm 131. Well, um, let me start by saying Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Happy New You. I mean, this is the time of year where we have great hopes for great accomplishments in the year. Right? This is the time where the break is over, the lull uh, at the end of the year has ceased, and now we are attacking a new year with fervor. Uh, It's a busy time, it's a noisy time, gears are getting to go again, and uh, you know, you've got some new goals maybe, some new ambitions for this new year. And so this would be a great Sunday for me to stand up and talk about goal setting or stretching your faith to accomplish tremendous things, things you never thought that you could accomplish this year. It would be a great Sunday for me to talk about self-discipline, to talk about mission, uh, to talk about uh, accomplishing great things, to talk about change. I heard a pastor say, always in January, talk about life change because everybody's ready to change for 30 days or so, but talk about change. This is the time to talk about that. But I'm afraid if I came and brought a rah-rah, this is your year kind of a message, uh, I fear that I'd be only contributing to the busyness and the noisiness that already resides in your soul. So I'm going to talk about something very different. This is the anti-typical New Year's message. This is the counterintuitive biblical approach to the new year. I want to talk about calming your soul. I want to talk about the quiet soul. These aren't terms from um, some Eastern religion. These are terms from the Bible that we're going to see in just a moment. The calm and the quiet soul. That's the Lord's will for you today, is that you would have a calm and a quiet soul. And it's a gift. The calm and quiet soul is a gift from the Holy Spirit, but it is something that we must cultivate because it is easy to introduce things into our hearts and minds that agitate and trouble and uh, destroy the quiet soul that God intends us to have. We must cultivate the quiet soul, and for this reason, we're going to look at Psalm 131, where God addresses the quiet soul, where David speaks of his quiet soul, and we're going to see a little bit about what what is involved in cultivating a quiet soul at the beginning of a year that is filled with activity and noise and ambition and plans and goals, none of which are wrong in and of themselves but can quickly replace uh, the centrality of a heart at rest before God. Psalm 131, this is God's word. A song of a sense of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I've calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord for this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. God, as we come to you in your word this morning, we pray that you would grant us the gift of illumination from the scripture, that you would speak to us from your word, and that what we just read would increasingly become our reality, that in Christ we could experience a rest from the kind of striving and worry and anxiety and fear 
that dominates so many of our minds. We this morning cast our cares on you and pray that you would show us the resurrected Savior afresh, that we might find confidence for this new year in you, that we might find faith for this new year, and that we might find rest for our troubled hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is a psalm where David communicates confidence in the Lord. He's communicating a confidence in the Lord that leads to a quiet soul. And I wonder as we're kicking off this new year, is that your experience? Do you experience a quiet soul? Are you here today as you anticipate tomorrow, work or school or whatever you will be doing, caring for kids, whatever tomorrow looks like for you, do you sit here today with a quiet soul as you anticipate this coming week? Do you know how to calm a noisy soul? Do you know how to cultivate that? I'm not talking about a certain kind of personality. Sometimes we can think that way. Well, I'm just type A. That's just the way I am. My mom was type A and her dad was type A. That's just the way we are. We're just wired to be intense. I'm not talking about some kind of personality, like a very laid back person versus a very intense person. I'm not talking about circumstances. I'm not talking about creating a life with very few responsibilities or limited activities. David is the king of a nation. He lives with more responsibilities on his shoulder than all of ours combined. He has an entire nation, God's people, looking to him for leadership. His schedule is more packed than yours or mine. He has pressures that we cannot imagine, and yet he is the one who is speaking of encountering God in such a way that with all of his responsibilities, he lives with a quiet soul, even with a high-demand life. He describes a work of God in the heart that changes his view, both of God and of himself. And really what's key in this psalm is that cultivating a quiet soul, as David describes here, involves knowing your place. He knows his place here. He's the king of God's people, yet he knows his place. And he knows God's place. And he's committed to never confusing the two. For when we forget our place and forget God's place and confuse the two, it is there where we lose so frequently the calm, trusting soul at rest in Christ. Know your place. Know God's place. And refuse by faith to, to confuse the two. Well, here's a few things about a quiet soul in this passage. Really, I want to look at four things in the passage that speak of the quiet soul. The first is, the quiet soul is not proud. Is not proud. So, the fight for a quiet soul is often the fight uh, for humility. The fight against pride. The first phrases in the psalm speak of pride. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up, and my eyes are not raised too high. My heart is not lifted up, and my eyes are not raised too high. Now, it's interesting. The New American Standard, which is typically a very literal translation, and the NIV, not as literal, but both of those translate this verse uh, exactly the same, different than the ESV, which I'm reading from this morning. They translate it this way. My heart is not proud, and my eyes are not haughty which is not a different meaning, but perhaps a clearer meaning for what we read. My heart is not lifted up. He's saying my heart is not proud. My eyes are not raised too high. What does that mean? It means that my eyes are not haughty. The proud person is the person whose heart is lifted up. And I know that experience daily, lifting my own heart up, um, full of myself, consumed with myself, focused on myself, aware of myself. But the quiet heart is not primarily the self-focused heart that is lifted up in importance, lifted up in vision, lifted up in awareness, lifted up in, as, as, uh, as prominent. He also says his eyes aren't raised too high. What's he mean? Why do they translate it haughty eyes? Because it means raised too high in relation to others. The raising of the eyes, the haughty eyes, are the eyes that look down upon another. 
The haughty eyes are the eyes that are judging, critiquing, evaluating other people. It's the eyes that are looking down, that are constantly measuring. How do I measure up with others? Am I more talented? Am I more wealthy? Am I, more, am I better liked? Am I more attractive? Even in a context like this, am I more godly? Is my family more godly? Is my, how does my marriage line up with others? Where's my place among the other single adults in this church? How do I, how are my kids compared? It's, all, it's the eyes that are always evaluating and the eyes that are lifted high, the haughty eyes are the ones that, that look down upon another where I find my own security in being a bit higher, a bit better than someone else. Now the tricky thing about pride is that it's not only lofty eyes that look down down so that I feel superior to others, but it's just the search itself, because sometimes the search ends up with self-critique, envy, jealousy of other people, and that's pride at work in the same way. It's just an inverted kind of pride. When I'm looking, I may say, well, my eyes, I don't look down upon other people. Matter of fact, I'm jealous of them. I'm envious of them, but all comparison is rooted in that kind of haughty eyes, the lifted up eyes. It's rooted in pride. And pride is self-focus. And self-focus will never produce the calm, quiet heart. And that's why he starts with pride. My heart is not lifted up. I am not consumed with me. And I am not looking down upon others or comparing, I'm adding this, he says looking down, but I'm saying pride works the same way because we may say, well, I don't think I'm better than other people. It's just the opposite. And I'm going to say pride is the exact same thing because it's the, it's the eyes that look to achieve haughtiness. It's the eyes that are hoping to evaluate myself as better than someone else. Because of our constant temptation to lift up our hearts, to lift our eyes in comparison to others. One of the greatest deterrents to a quiet soul in our culture, I believe, is social media. And I'm not the anti-social media guy at all. I participate. I preached on this not too long ago and told our church, some of you need to absolutely get off of social media. And some of you who are not on social media, you actually need to get on. The Lord wants you on social media. I can't say that, but you need to ask him. So I actually think some people should be on that aren't. But I think others of us that are should get off or should monitor very carefully because here's what's unique about haughty eyes, lifting myself up, evaluating myself with other people. We, we live in a very unique world, and we need to realize that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever new platform is out or is coming out provide something that has never existed in human history. The uplifted heart and haughty eyes have always existed. They're the root of the fall, as a matter of fact. So they've always existed. But what has never existed in the history of humanity is 24-hour access to a highly edited version of all of your digital friends' happiest moments in life. That's what's never been available. What's never been available is to be able to see at any moment everyone's best faces, their most romantic dates, their most memorable vacation highlights, their kids' brightest moments and cutest sayings, their workouts, which actually might be a bit of a motivation at this time of the year, but will get very sour come about February. I don't want to hear how long you ran, okay? Don't, tell, don't post it because I sat and ate a gallon of ice cream. So please, <laughs> constantly looking at what their clothes, even their best meals, their job, everything, constantly there in front around us to e e evaluate. And not only our friends, but people that used to be our friends back in high school that we can now compare ourselves with. And not only the people that we used to know, but the people that aren't our friends, but we wish they were as we stalk their social media feeds and watch and admire and compare our lives to people that don't even know our names. It's a sickening thing. <laughs> The heart, where do I stand? How am I measured? It's the haughty eyes. It is the uplifted heart. It is the noisy soul. 
Studies show that millennials in particular are experiencing depression and anxiety at a rate higher than previous generations. And those who know about these things say that in one part, uh, they, they attribute that in part to the temptation of social media. The temptation to see and be aware of what happened that I was left out of, uh, who has a better life than I do, in a way that has never been available in history. Maybe you say, well, I don't post things and compare myself, but but I do want to ask you, how do you post? Before you posted that one picture, were there 15 selfies before you got the right one to put up there to hopefully be liked so that you could look and feel good and superior or secure about yourself. A quiet soul is not proud. It is not self-focused. It is found in many ways beyond social media. I'm just mentioning one that's common in our culture, just one. But he says that when this happens, there is is, um, there is a lack of peace in the soul. David says, I am not lifting my heart up. I am not looking down on other people. The quiet soul is not proud. Secondly, the quiet soul is not presumptuous. Here's what presumptuous means. Presumptuous means failing to observe the limits of what is permitted or appropriate. Let me say that again. Presumption or presumptuous is failing to observe the limits of what is permitted or what is appropriate. That's exactly what the second part of verse 1 is talking about. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. In other words, he's saying, I know my place. I know God's place, and I'm not seeking to break that line, cross that barrier into things where I don't belong. That's what he's talking about. He's not saying that I live an uninspired life. This is so helpful. If this had been some random guy writing, it would still be God's word and we would believe it. But I think it's glorious that God chose the most powerful, responsible man on the planet at the time of this writing for God's purposes, who we remember throughout the New Testament, who even Jesus himself is identified as a son of David. David is a highlighted man. I think it's wonderful that the Lord gives us a picture of him because it doesn't, it clearly does not mean that God does not want us to have any ambition, that God does not want us to have lofty goals, that God does not want to stretch us in any way that God does not want us to be productive. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying when he says, I do not live, occupy myself with, with things too great and too wonderful. He doesn't mean that he just sits on the couch and does nothing and thinks nothing and that that's somehow godly. This man is accomplishing great things. He is the king of Israel. He is not advocating that we aim low in life or that we accomplish as little as possible, but he's advocating that we know the boundaries God has set and we live with them by faith and actually joy in the boundaries that God has set. Things too great, things too marvelous, that applies to God. And so I'm not occupying myself with things that are God's business and not mine. That is so important. I'm not occupying myself with things that are God's responsibility, God's knowledge, God's plan, and not mine. If there is a singular message that rings true in the Bible from the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it's this, that there is one God and you are not him. And David is here saying, I am not, I don't occupy myself. I'm not giving myself to the stuff that is not mine to be concerned about. He's occupied with great things, the ruling of God's people, the nation of Israel, living for God's glory before the nations. He's he's given himself to something that is indeed arguably great and marvelous, but there are things that are too great for him, that are beyond him. He isn't seeking to know the unknowable. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. There are secret things that belong to God. There are revealed things 
that tell us what we need to know to live for God, to walk with God, to, to live the life that God's called us to. And he reveals those things to us through his word and through providence. He teaches us those things. But there are things that we don't know. There are things that he won't explain to us. There's things that he does that he does not give us a window into his purpose and his reasoning. And it is those things that often when we seek to cross the barrier, to pry into a vision of why God and looking in to try to understand the purposes of God in areas that he's not revealed, it is often there where our soul becomes very noisy and not very quiet. By occupying himself with things too great, not, to, not occupying himself with things too great and too marvelous, David is avoiding the temptation to play God. David Powelson, who is a biblical counselor, said this, Most of the noise in our souls is generated by trying to control the uncontrollable. That's what this verse means. Most of the noise in our souls is generated by trying to control the uncontrollable. Those are the things that often bring such turmoil to our souls, but we cannot know why certain people do what they do, why circumstances sometimes turn out the way that they do. I mean, I want to live a completely predictable life where things were orchestrated just as I orchestrated them. And when a surprise comes, I fully understand it. Even if I didn't expect it, I fully understand it, and it meets my approval. That's wanting to be God. Writing my own story in life and and getting my way is the ultimate in lifting up my heart. But, But David says, I don't occupy myself with things that are too great for me. There is this barrier between God and me. And when I am trying to control or wanting to control the uncontrollable, that will always create a noisy soul, will displace the peace that the Holy Spirit gives to us as a gift. When you try to control people, when you try to control circumstances that you cannot control, you will find yourself with a noisy soul that shouts at you with constant worries and anxieties and fears and worst-case scenarios, burdens. So much of this, I was so helped by this comment by Pallison, so much of this I realized in my own life is when I'm trying to control the uncontrollable. <laughs> I just got to tell you this because this is crazy. Um, I'm speaking on this right now, and I had to monitor my time. So when we started, I go down to John and say, can I have my phone? While we're going, while I'm preaching, about five minutes ago, full transparency, a text comes up on my screen. And I'm like, oh, oh, wait, I never look at a screen when I preach because we have a clock in the back of the room, and I didn't bring in a watch. And so I don't ever have this. And I started worrying. I'm preaching to you, and this text is worrisome. <laughs> I'm, bur- I'm thinking, Lord, I'm tr- how can I do this? I don't ever, I'm, I'm usually very engaged in my sermon, but I'm actually preaching to you, and about for the last two to three minutes, full disclosure, I'm worried about this text that I just saw. This can happen when you are preaching on the calm soul and the quiet soul. You can instantly face worry and anxiety. This is the Lord just wanting to I mess, not mess with me, humble me and just say, just be careful as you're preaching this so boldly. Realize that even at this moment, you could be given into worry in the middle of a sermon, <laughs> preaching on the quiet soul. John, just tell me when time's up, okay? Because I don't want to look. I might get my, another text. I don't want to know. I, just, I can't know. And I will now travel with a watch, okay? I, I will travel with a watch. What questions, let me ask you this, what questions do you just need to let go to have a quiet soul today. If you were to think of, if you were to say, that if you were to say this verse, you know, I am not going to think about things that are too great for me, that are beyond me. I'm going to worship God as God, and I'm going to be me in my place. I'm going to know my place. If you were to do that, and you were to repent today, what, what questions would you need to say, Lord, I'm letting that go. I am not going to go there, because that's your prerogative. Maybe it'd be questions like, why did this happen to me? 
Why did she die? Why am I not married? Why is my child not a Christian? I'm not saying you can't act in some of these ways. I'm not saying that you can't serve the Lord. I'm just saying the ultimate why question that just constantly comes up, why won't my husband change? Why am I not healed? Why has God not answered this particular prayer that I've prayed for years? Continue to pray the prayer. I'm not saying stop. Continue to pray the prayer. But there's a place where we have to, by faith, transfer responsibility to God. Humble ourselves and say, Lord, I, I'm going to pray this prayer, but I am going to trust you with it. I have to. You control this. I don't. I have to give up control. I have to. If I'm going to have a quiet soul, there are answers that God does not supply. I'm sure David had a few of those. God, why did you anoint me king and the current guy is throwing spears at me? God, why did you give me this family and one of my own sons rebels and seeks to take the kingdom? Why, God? Why are you allowing it? Why is this happening? I'm sure he knew what that meant. Presumption. The quiet soul is not proud. The quiet soul is not presumptuous. The quiet soul is not restless. At the heart of this psalm is this really powerful picture of a baby resting with its mother. Verse 2, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. David says, my soul is like a weaned child. It means it is at rest. Now, this is a poetic imagery that is pretty astounding. Uh, this is the leader of the nation. This is a king. This is a fierce warrior, a fierce warrior who actually shed more blood than he should have shed. He is a fierce warrior. And he says, you know what? When it comes to me and the Lord, this is the guy that slayed. This is how he got his entry and how he became famous. This is where David went viral among the nations, or at least among Israel, is he killed Goliath. And he says, you know, before the Lord, I'm not a warrior king. I'm like a little baby on its mother's lap that has, has been waned. Quiet, contented before God. Tremper Longman in his commentary, Old Testament scholar, says this about the picture. A weaned child can rest comfortably in its mother's arms, while a baby who is not yet weaned is fussy and restless. Here the psalmist provides a picture image of the kind of trusting confidence that he is now experiencing. Now, I'm sure he worried and fretted at various times, but at this moment, as he's thinking, as he's worshiping the Lord, that's what he's saying. Not a baby that is being held by its mother that is hungry, for, uh, fussing, trying to get towards the mother's breast or something that is, you know, agitated, crying. He's, no, this is like a child that is weaned and is at rest. I've calmed and quieted my soul. This is a corporate process, obviously, impl implied, if you read this in the context of all of Scripture, you will see that ultimately it is God by His Spirit that gives us rest in our soul. Only the Lord can provide that. And at the same time, He says, I have weaned and I have quieted my soul. There's a cooperative process. There is, it is the gift of God from His side. It is him providing the scripture, the word, which reveals truth to us so that we can put our confidence in God. We do see God as trustworthy. We do trust, we have reason to trust. That's the scripture. The Holy Spirit he gives us, which opens our heart, which, which, which draws our heart to the Lord. So he gives us the word and spirit. And yet we must at the same time cultivate this. That's where David could say, I did this. He's not saying God had nothing to do with it. But he's saying this is something that I was intentional about. I have calmed and quieted my soul. From our side, it's the process of turning to God. It's a process of turning away from endless questioning in our head, from endless pride and evaluation in our head. It is telling our souls to be quiet and listen to God. 
to, 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 to calm and quiet our souls, sometimes we have to address our souls and tell them, to tell them, I guess you don't have plural souls, tell, tell him or her or, I never thought about that, okay, I guess I have a, a male soul, I don't know, it, me, him, whoever, <laughs> I don't know, but tell my soul, uh, you know, to, to, to believe, to trust, to listen to the Lord. There's a famous saying by Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a British preacher in the mid-1900s, where he famously said, have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? It is telling the restless soul that God is good and God is in control. It is telling the restless soul that God is faithful, that he holds my life in his hands, and that he is to be trusted even when I don't understand, even when I don't get an explanation. It is asking for his peace and his rest to calm my thoughts. It is, it is, it is thinking in terms of addressing my own heart and soul with God's word and being intentional. And saying, I don't want to be the restless, fussy baby. Lord, I want my heart to be at rest. And so I don't want to lift it up in pride, full of myself. I don't want to look down upon others or compare myself with others. I don't want to be occupying my thoughts with all of the whys for which I will never get an answer this side of the return of Christ. So the quiet soul is not proud, it is not presumptuous. The quiet soul rather hopes in the Lord. It's not restless either. It's not proud. It's not presumptuous. It's not restless. Sorry, they don't all start with P. And it's also the, on the positive side. Those are the negatives. On the positive side, it hopes in the Lord. Look at verse 3. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. David addresses God's people, trust in the Lord. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't offer any sort of detailed or complex way to do that. He just says, trust the Lord. He's given this picture of the child, which a child just is, man, I don't figure everything out, you know. The, the difference in, a, you know, uh, a, a child is easily at rest without knowing all of uh, an explanation of all that happens. He doesn't offer us any complicated process. He says, just trust like a child. Now, some commentators have made a, a point, which I think is very helpful, that this psalm, these, this series of psalms called the Song of Ascent, the Songs of Ascent, they were sung by the people of God as they journeyed on pilgrimage to Jerusalem for one of the three festivals each year. So as they're traveling, they have like a song book. They have something to worship and sing as they go. Um, so these are psalms that would be sung uh, as the people are approaching the city, getting ready for their uh, annual, the three festivals each year. The Song of Ascents, it means to ascend uh, to Jerusalem is where the, the name comes from. So the psalm that was sung right before this, if, if they sang them in order, I don't know that, but if, if they did, or at least in the same set of psalms, the same language is used. So look at verse, look at chapter 130, uh, Psalm 130 rather, right before this. O Israel, hope in the Lord. So commentators point out, these are tied. Our verse, 131.3, O Israel, hope in the Lord. The psalm before, in the Song of Ascent, Psalm 137, O Israel, hope in the Lord. And here we get a reason. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Isn't that wonderful? What is the focus of trust? So in the context of this set of psalms, the same line is used, hope in God. Don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. Don't be presumptuous. Don't be proud. But instead, trust the Lord. Why? Because he has steadfast love. He has an unchanging, faithful love for us that never ends, that never changes. It's his faithful covenant love. And for us, we know that in Jesus Christ. God has come to us in Jesus and our soul is quieted when we remember Christ and what he has done for us. That's the steadfast love. Listen, we have got it way better than David. 
way better. He, he, his soul is at rest with the promise of Christ coming. He is on the other side of the cross and resurrection. But this side of the cross and resurrection, we know the Savior who has come and given his life for us. He has died in our place. He has, as it says here, he has brought plentiful redemption. How does Christ bring plentiful redemption? He lives a perfect life. Uh, he obeys the law in our place. He dies for our sins. He's buried and he's resurrected on the third day to defeat the power of our sin and to give eternal life to all who will believe in him. He gives us the promise, the certainty of eternal life in his presence. And he gives us the promise that he will see us there faithfully, that he will hold us, that he will take us all the way, that he will never leave or forsaken us. He took the punishment for our sin so that all our sins are forgiven. That's what he says. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. That's the hope that Israel's to have. That's the hope that we are to have. And you want to talk about a quiet soul? A quiet soul is realizing all of my sins are forgiven in Christ. What a rest that you, you could never have been good enough, religious enough, moral enough, holy enough to be right with God. And Jesus came and gave his life, died for you, was buried and raised so that by faith in him, you can be united with Christ, one with Christ, uh, him in you, Christ in you, and you in Christ. You can be declared righteous before God. You can be adopted into his family. He is your father who loves and cares for you. You can only be accepted by God, acceptable to God by receiving what Jesus did for you. And that's why it is the steadfast love of the Lord, 130 verse 7. It is the redemption from all our iniquities, 130 verse 8. It is plentiful redemption in Christ. It is here that we find our hope in the Lord. And so though David had a wonderful experience of God, he did not have the same existential experience of God that we do this side of the cross and resurrection. That's why we are part of a better better covenant, the Bible says, because God himself lives in us by the Holy Spirit, and he is conforming us, and he is at work in us, and he is changing us, and he will give us the power to have a quiet soul. We can be at rest because we are in Christ. We can be at rest because we are forgiven and accepted and adopted by God Almighty. It is by looking at the cross and resurrection that we now have a calm soul that, that we can, that we know God cares for us. He is caring for us. He will care for us. He will never stop caring for us. Whether I get the answer to the big questions of my life, the things that don't make sense to me, whether they're ever explained to me or not, I have confidence that he has met my greatest need and that therefore he will meet all my lesser needs. This is what Romans 8.32 says. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he uh, not also with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8.32. If your soul is, rest, is restless today, look that verse up, write that down, type that in your notes, whatever. Memorize that verse. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? It's saying really what verses 7 and 8 are saying of Psalm 130 that then lead into Psalm 131. It's saying that if God has met your greatest need, will he not also take care of the rest? If he has met your greatest need, whether you felt it or not, your great, or whether you feel it or not, your greatest need is how can I be right with a holy God? He has met that need. He has met that need. Now, will he not take care of health, finances, marriage, job, children, relationships, loneliness, all of the things that we face, will he not meet those? This is the truth. We must feed our souls when we are discouraged, when we are questioning, when we are living with unanswered questions. He's working all things for our good, and the proof of that is we look to the cross, we look to the empty tomb, and we look to the promise that Christ is in us. Christ will return for us as well. We can rest in his goodness. We can cultivate a quiet soul we have our place. He has his place. But the wonderful promise in Christ is that he has us as well. He has us. So what is the noise in your soul that is muting that truth? 
So we have various noises, voices in our minds that mute this truth, that it feels pretty clear right now, perhaps, but it gets c- confusing during the week. What are, where's the restlessness, the agitation in your soul? Where are you fearful or anxious? Let me give a couple thoughts to close that'll help maybe apply some of this. Here's the starting point. This sounds so basic, but I, I think it's huge. I think it's huge. Realize that a calm soul is God's design for you. Not, a, not an easy life, not smooth circumstances, not physical prosperity, not lack of suffering, didn't say anything like that. But a calm soul at rest, confident in Christ, that's God's will for us. That's not just like the random person that doesn't have much going on or the person that's just really easygoing or the clueless person that is like too dumb to worry. It's not, no, <laughs> make me that dumb, Lord. No, 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 it is God's will that in you, you have peace with God. And that's the starting place where some of us just say, fruit of faith in the gospel is increasing rest in my soul. This year, as we grow in our understanding of the gospel, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, as we grow in applying grace to our life, what the Lord wants to do is increasingly give us rest in our soul. That is just great news. We don't have to earn this. This is God's gift. We just cultivate it. Secondly, ask God to help you turn from pride and presumption. Look at those two things. Where is their comparison? Where is their pride? How is that bringing about a restlessness in your soul? And where is their presumption? Think of those things and ask God to help you deal with them. I would say if your soul's not at rest, I would memorize this psalm. Maybe, maybe you say, hey, I don't memorize a lot of scripture. Th- you could memorize this one by tonight. You really could. It's three verses. Um, there's no big words. It's, it, it, you know, it's like you understand. I understand. In the English translation here, I understand every word. Your elementary school kid would probably understand every word. But it's so comforting to think about a soul at at the heart, like at rest, calming, quiet, like a winged child, even for a king who uh, rules a rules a nation. Or memorize Romans eight thirty two, God, my soul is not at rest; it's agitated. But you have met, and it's agitated because I'm worried about all these things. But you've met my greatest need. I know I can give you these other needs because I think of what Christ did for me on the cross in his resurrection to unite me to him. And then here's the last one. Though this has talked about a calmness of heart and a quiet of heart, quietness of heart, some of us need to have an external physical quietness in our lives to help cultivate this. Some of us have noise going constantly. It is, there's never a quiet moment in your life. And it's hard to have a quiet soul if there's not some time where you're, you're quiet before him. I found it very helpful. Tim Keller was asked in an online Q&A on Twitter, he was asked, why do you think young Christian adults, young adults, why do you think young adults struggle uh, mo- most deeply with God as a personal reality in their lives? I said, why do you think that a lot of young adults don't sense the reality of God in their lives? His answer was noise and distraction. It's easier to tweet than pray. He said that on Twitter, very ironic. <laughs> because if I wasn't on Twitter, I wouldn't have known that. So, you know, okay. But, but now, now I need to shut it down and go, go listen. So what is the noise? Is it, you, is it your email? Is it your TV? Is it, is it the kids? Um, and so maybe it involves being up later than them or getting up earlier than them. Uh, what is the noise? Is it the news? Is it sports? Uh, is it music? Is it, what, what is it that, that gets you where you can't be still physically? before God, and, and what is it that you could address? How can I have a quiet soul in the midst of busyness? If I'm going to have a quiet soul in the midst of busyness, there must be some place of actual quiet before God in my life to gather these thoughts and meditate on them. Here's the last thing, and I'm done. Seek, find, a, find a physically quiet place. The last thing would ask for help. If you are trapped in... Uh, if you're trapped in some kind of pride, if you're trapped in comparison, uh, if you are trapped in an addiction 
to social media and how are people liking what you are doing. Uh, if you're trapped in presumption, you cannot get past the question why. And you say, nice, nice thoughts, nice sermon, but you don't understand. I still can't get past why. If that's you and you're trapped in that situation, you need to talk to someone about that. Here's what I found. I've got a couple of areas in my life, one primary and a couple of other secondary tertiary issues that are noisy in my soul and not, don't, don't help me. And what I found, when I take that out of my head, first of all, I get in a quiet place, I pray, that's helpful. Memorize scripture, that's helpful. Um, ask God for help, that's helpful. Pray. But here's another thing that's helpful. Sometimes when I take the noise in my head, and I just like spit it out, not literally, spit it out and, and speak it to a friend. This is what's going on in my head. And I say it to a friend. Sometimes just the getting it out, boom, it goes. Sometimes just acknowledging, because when I say it, it's foolish. It's like, well, of course God's greater than that. Of course God's more faithful than that. But when I say it, when I bring it to the light, sometimes the light, disintegrates it. But even if it doesn't, my friend is then able to say, is able to give me some scripture, give me some hope, be a listening ear. Let me know someone's with me in this. So I'm not just carrying it along I'm all by myself. Could be my wife, could be a friend, someone who, who supports me, helps me, cares for me, walks with me. Sometimes they share a scripture with me. I think about this one situation where I just could not, I just restless, agitated. I said to go knock on my I work with Christians, I'm a pastor, so I knocked on my coworker's door and just said, can I tell you, I didn't use this word, but basically, can I tell you the noise of my soul? I can't even think straight today. Let me tell you my burden. And I told it to him, and he just put a hand on my shoulder and prayed. And the power of opening something up so that someone else is walking with me in it, that is a gift to help, uh, help calm and quiet our souls. He's given us the word, he's given us the spirit, He's given us his people, and we need to lean into all three of them to experience the quiet soul. So if your soul is noisy and anxious and distracted, ask someone for prayer and counsel, and you may find just the communicating of what you're wrestling with may be a tremendous help. And even if not, they'll pray, they'll help, and they'll walk with you. In this coming year, I pray the Lord does great things in your life, I pray you meet the goals that he's put on your heart and in your life. But I pray no matter what happens this year, that you follow and you pursue him with a heart that is at rest in trust of God. Let's pray. Lord, we today just acknowledge the noisiness of our souls before you. And we confess our need for you. We pray that through your word and through your spirit and through our spouses and our friends and our family and those in our church community that we're joined together with, I pray that you would grant us grace today and in the weeks and months of the year that, that holds so much promise in front of us. I pray that regardless of what happens in our circumstances, that we could this year rest in Christ, that we could experience what we read about today, the heart that is not lifted up, the, the soul that is, that is not presumptuous, the heart that is at rest like a weaned child, that we would hope in you and in your steadfast love. God, do this for us. We pray for your glory that we may serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.